we are live just want to confirm we are live okay and we have started recording so if you would like to call us to order president Vasquez. okay i call the meeting of the san juan unified school district board of education to order there are two closed session items on tonight's agenda the first item is conference with legal counsel existing litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9 subsection d1 name of case magali kincaid benito juarez neighborhood association neighborhood elections now juan inigas carolina flores damaris canton versus san juan unified school district complaint for violation of the california voting rights act and in the alternative for violation of the voting rights act of 1965 in the California Constitution, Sacramento Superior Court case number 34202000286475. And collective bargaining matters, discussion with negotiator Jim Shoemake, Assistant Superintendent, Schools and Labor Relations regarding CSEA Chapter 127, General Operations Support, Chauffeurs, Teamsters Local Number 150, Transportation, Supervisors, Teachers, and Certificated Supervisory Units and regarding non-represented groups, management and confidential units. Government code section 54957.6. Mr. Allen, will you please give instructions to those in attendance via Zoom on how they can raise their hand if they have a comment on the closed, assession, closed session agenda items at this time? I'd be happy to, President Viasquez. If you've joined us on the Zoom platform tonight and would like to offer a comment on either of the two topics that are on the closed session agenda, now would be your opportunity to do so. You would do that by clicking that raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on your mobile device or desktop client, or if you've dialed in to the meeting tonight by pressing star nine on your telephone keypad. And thank we do have you. one hand raised at this time, yeah. President Vasquez. Okay, thanks, Mr. Allen. Sorry for uh, jumping in over you. Please go ahead and um, facilitate public comments. I would like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes per speaker and the clock on the screen will count down the time. Thank you, President Viasquez. Our first speaker will be Scott Rafferty. Mr. Rafferty, when you are ready, sir. We lost a congressman yesterday. Arizona did not gain a congressman. Texas was expected to gain three. They didn't. Florida was expected to gain two. They didn't. What do all these things have in common? They're the first validations of what we told you in our petition more than a year ago. It's going to be a really bad census for Latinos. That's why we said it was so critical to install a Latino district member in the majority influence district. But you ignored us. We had the superintendent say, we're waiting till after, we wanted to wait till after the census. You passed a resolution that left 2020 out, even though you told people in the room that you were gonna go that year. And then, and then you said you were going to save money doing that. We knew that wasn't true. So what do all these things have in common? And you told the governor that the, that the registrars across the state can implement it. So you didn't have our letter, which you were required to distribute at the meeting under the Brown Act. Departures from normal processes, contemporaneous statements, pretexts that turn out to be false. What are all these things have in common? They are all the ways you prove intentional racial discrimination. So don't think the day the governor's order goes away that you can get back on track. You can't. You're choosing, unless you settle this case and do the right thing, you're choosing a course that will create in further litigation and will ultimately find you guilty of intentional racial discrimination. Is that something you really want for this district? Thank you very much. And thank you for your comment. President Viasquez, that is our only raised hand and we have no submitted comments for closed session at this time. Okay, we will now move into closed session and we will return to open session at 6.30. The board is moving into closed session at this time. They do expect to return to public session at 6.30 p.m. You are welcome to stay with us here on the Zoom environment if you would like, or you are welcome to return at 6.30 p.m. as well. Thank you again for being with us, and we will see you at 6.30.
Testing, Mr. Allen, can you hear the boardroom? We can, President Viasquez, and we are recording, so when you are ready. Fantastic. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education back to order. The board is meeting in the boardroom at the district office, safely, physically distanced, and aligned with state and local health guidelines. Public attendance is provided via the Zoom platform, as well as via live stream on the district's YouTube channel. The meeting is being audio and video recorded, and the recording may capture sounds and images of those in attendance. The recording will be posted on the district's website. We thank you for joining us and ask for your patience as we use this format in an effort to maximize access and participation during this time of social distancing and other restrictions. At this time, please stand for the virtual presentation of the colors by the Del Campo High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Ready. Oh, we're good. Eng. Uh. Gary. Allers. Lower. Arch. Left. 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 Allers. Arch. Allegarn. Alt. Present. Scholars, please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gary, Scholars, Post, Scholars, Colors, color turn, arch. Good evening and welcome. I'm Paula Viesquez, board president, and to my right is Dr. Michael McKibben board vice president, and to his right is Ms. Pam Costa, board member. To my left is Ms. Zima Creason, board clerk, and to her left is Mr. Saul Hernandez, board member, and Superintendent Kern is also in attendance. Before we begin, I'd like to review the two methods that are available to submit public comment for tonight's meeting. The first option is to submit a public comment online using the comment form located on the district website at www sanjuan.edu slash board meeting. If you wish to submit a public comment on more than one agenda item, please submit a separate form for each item on which you are commenting. Comments received by 6 p.m. today have already been shared with all board members. Comments received after 6 p.m. tonight, including those submitted during the meeting, may be read during the meeting, depending on time restrictions. Comments may only be submitted on an agenda item up until the time the agenda item has been discussed. The second option is on the Zoom platform where you may use the raise your hand feature. When you are called on, you may share a comment via audio during the meeting. Please note that all public comments are subject to a two lim minute limit or approximately 1500 characters. With that, we are at item D, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? 
Seeing none. Is there a motion to approve the minutes for April 13th? It's been moved by Mr. Hernandez. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are now at item E1, and tonight we have two recognitions. We will begin with California Day of the Teacher. Mr. Oropolo. Good evening, President Vasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham. I'm here tonight to present the superintendent's recommendation that the governing board adopt resolution A403, proclaiming May 12th, 2021, as the California Day of the Teacher. As you know, our teachers represent the fundamental mission of our district. They educate, inspire, encourage, nurture, and consistently demonstrate dedication, hard work, and service to our students. We are joined tonight by Bill Simmons via Zoom, president of the San Juan Teachers Association, to say a few words. Members of the board and Superintendent Kern, I wanna thank you on behalf of the 2,400 teachers, counselors, speech language pathologists, teacher librarians, social workers, and nurses for recognizing the Day of the Teacher and School Nurses Week. As you are well aware, this last 15 months has been challenging for everyone, but all of the professional educators in San Juan have gone above and beyond to cultivate the minds and provide healing hearts for our students and families as the learning environment changed dramatically. I also wanna thank the parents and community members that have supported and cared for teachers and nurses during distance learning. We have never faced such a health crisis in our lifetime, but with the focus on student learning, we have all worked together for the safety of our community while adapting to this wicked virus. We all learned so many things in order to continue in a remote COVID-19 world. Educators, students, families, learn how to Zoom, seesaw, post on Google Classroom in conjunction with what we normally do, applying math principles, reading, history, science, and all of the academic learning that took place. And our nurses interpreted health guidance, providing training and contract tracing above and beyond their normal workday. As, and as we look to the future, we know it's brighter because of what San Juan educators and nurses have done this year with the students in a pandemic. And we hope everyone continues to follow health guidelines so that we can, can return to a full school year in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Do any board members have comments or questions? I'll do a double. Thank you very much um, to Mr. Simmons and of course to our, our membership and to your membership and to our teachers and to our staff. Um, it's been an interesting 15 months and I think at the, especially at the outset, I remember um, the public sentiment was give our teachers all of the raises. Now, you know, our parents at home were, were the ones doing, doing a lot of, of the work. And um, I know that probably felt like it lasted way too, way too brief throughout this entire um, event. But I just want to say from me personally, um, that that sentiment never changed. You all remain heroes. We've asked you to be chameleons and change your <laughs> job descriptions and how you do it nearly overnight. Um, and it, you've continued to, to show up for our students time and time again. So I just wanna say thank you. And on behalf of the board, thank you. Um, at this time, is there a motion to adopt resolution number A403, proclaiming May 12th as California Day of the Teacher? So moved. It's been moved by Ms. Costa. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Ms. Creason. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye. that was unanimous. Thank you. And I'm Thank you, excited. President Friascus. Thank you for joining us.
Our next recognition is for National Nurses Week and National School Nurse Day. Dr. Calvin, please begin when you are ready. Good evening, President Viasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. The superintendent is recommending that the board adopt resolution number A404 proclaiming May 6 through 12 as National Nurses Week and May 12th as National School Nurse Day. Here to accept the resolution via Zoom is lead school nurse Derek Stevenson and program manager for student support services, Sandra Batark. Thank you, Dr. Calvin. On behalf of our San Juan Unified Nurses, I will turn it directly over to Derek Stevenson, our lead nurse. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Superintendent Kern, President Viasquez, members of the board, and Ms. Cunningham. On the behalf of my colleagues in health services, it's my honor to accept this recognition of nurses. This has been a year that none of us will forget. Uh, we've all had to adapt to the ever-changing realities of the COVID pandemic that has drastically changed how we educate our students. My colleagues, have done an amazing job of providing support and guidance to students, families, and staff that they work with during this unprecedented time. They have admirably executed the mission of health services, which is to strive to ensure all students have access to safe and healthy environment in which to learn. On behalf of the school nurses and LVNs who work for San Juan Unified, I thank you for this recognition of the important work that we do for the district. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Do any board members have any comments or questions at this time? On behalf of the board, I just want to say thank you very much. I, I don't know if anybody signed up to be a uh, school school nurse during a global pandemic, but um, you know, I, I can't think of a more frontline job. And I know, again, like everybody, you've had to kind of transition day by day at points, um, but every day showed up to, to serve our children and to serve our community. So I thank you very much for your service during this critical, cr critical, critical time. Um, is there a motion to adopt resolution number A404, proclaiming May 6th through 12th as National Nurses Week and May 12th as National School Nurse Day? It's been moved by Dr. McKibben. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Costa. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. Thank you. With that, we are now at item E2, High School Student Council reports. And tonight we will hear from student representatives from Bella Vista High School and Rio Americano High School. Welcome, and let's begin with Mia Hansen from Bella Vista. Good evening, President Piazquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. I'm Mia Hansen, and I'm the student body vice president at Bella Vista. This week was our first week back with cohorts A and B combined and the energy around campus has been very uplifting. It's been so nice seeing more of our peers and friends at school and classes have been so much more engaging with more discussion now that we're in person. Our link program has prepared our freshmen very well for being back on campus for the first time. They did small group tours at the campus and also made a campus tour video for those who can't for those who could not attend. The groups had up to five freshmen and they were specifically shown where each of their classes were. So they felt more confident in navigating the school. And along with showing them where each of their classes were, um, they also showed them where the important buildings were on campus, like the library office and the locker rooms. At our last presentation, Sophia Butler, the student body president, discussed some of the virtual activities that were in the works, and I'm happy to say that both were very successful. She discussed the virtual art show along with our virtual escape room. And for the virtual art show, students were able to submit any media of art to the virtual art gallery that ended up having over 120 submissions. And our, and our virtual escape room, um, Students could work in groups to solve a treasure hunt and that was super pop 
the VLR among the student body. I will link the virtual art show in the chat and I would encourage you guys to take a look because there was a lot of great artwork from our student body. And um, since some of the students um, are at school and some are online, student government has continued to brainstorm activities that both groups are able to participate in. One of the activities is our Spring Spirit Week, which is actually this week. The students staying home are participating through social media by posting pictures um, of them dressing up for the Spirit Day on their Instagram stories. And then the students at school are coming to school dressed up on campus. And they also have the option to post pictures on their social media um, along with some backdrops that we made correlating with the Spirit Day. And we are also doing another virtual escape room since that was so popular the first round. Um, the senior class is really looking forward to an in-person graduation that really uplifted the mood, um, getting that great news. And then our athletes are having a lot of fun being able to play sports again. And many of our teams are getting off to a great start. Currently, both of our varsity water polo teams are undefeated and they have a big game against Wood Creek tonight. So thank you so much for the chance to talk about what's going on at Bella Vista. Thank you, Mia, for your presentation. Do any board members have questions or comments? Thank you very much for your report. Mia, I just wanted to um, see, I'm making an assumption that you are a senior. And if so, I was just wondering if you could discuss a little bit about your future plans. I am a senior, so my future plans are to attend the University of San Diego in the fall. I actually do... Um, rowing up at Lake Natoma. I'm on Capital Crew. And so I've committed to row at the University of San Diego, which is very exciting. That's pretty neat. That's very exciting. Congratulations. And we wish you the best in your future endeavors. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Next up, we will hear from Tessa Lufborough from Rio Americano. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Tessa Lufbro, and I'm the ASB treasurer at Rio Americano High School. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you. Today, I'll be expressing some of the positive experiences that my fellow students and I have had, as well as some of the challenges we faced through our transition back into in-person learning. So far, over the last two weeks or a couple weeks that we've been in person, I know students have really enjoyed seeing everybody and being in classes together. Also, getting out early is super helpful for work or homework or other extracurricular activities. Overall, there's definitely a boost in morale with teachers and administrators, and that rubs off on the students, making learning a lot more fun. Um, I also know that students really love having no school on Wednesdays. Uh, some of the things that we are concerned about is that with cohorts A and B being combined and cohort C online, uh, it's not quite equitable with testing because cohorts A and B are able to test or have to test in class, whereas cohort C is all online and they have other resources. And I think that's something that's holding kids back from returning. And I wouldn't want that to deter people. Another question that students had was, many students are in the position where they would like to play two sports, but they're unable to because of the restrictions only allowing them to play one sport. Now that we've merged cohorts and athletes are being tested weekly, students would like the district to consider allowing students to join two sports teams especially since many seasons have been moved to the same time, therefore their conditioning or games overlap. Um, right now, uh, we're working with student government to create a senior appreciation week, which will happen May 10th. Um, we'll have dress up week along with sweatshirts and prepackaged items that we'll hand out to seniors. And we're really hoping that as we move into the orange tier or hopefully the yellow tier, uh, we'll be able to have at least one senior event outside of graduation. Um, and that's all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tessa, for your report and for joining us. Um, do any of my uh, colleagues have questions or comments at this time? We really appreciate you being here. And I just want to say I also appreciate the feedback on the combined cohorts. I know this is... Um, it's day two, but um, we really, really appreciate hearing from, from you directly. Um, and I'm also just curious, you know, as a senior, what are your future plans? Uh, it's kind of crazy because I'm actually going 
also going to University of San Diego. Uh-huh. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm very excited. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a lot of UC San Diego love right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm really excited about that, yeah. Excellent. Do you know what you might plan to study yet? Uh, international relations, hopefully, yeah. Awesome. Well, congratulations to you both headed to UC San Diego, and we also wish you well in all of your future endeavors. Thank you very much for joining us, Tessa. Thank you. And with that, we are now at items E3 through E6. Mr. Allen, do we have any reports from staff, board appointed district committees, employee organizations, or other district organizations? We do have a report from the LCAP PAC, Chair Tom Nelson and Student Chair Keenan Kokovic. Mr. Nelson, when you're uh, ready, I believe. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, good evening, uh, President Fiasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham. My name is Tom Nelson. I am chair of your LCAP Parent Advisory Committee. I'm here um, with our LCAP Leadership Student Chair, uh, Keenan, who will also be presenting. For the public who may not know, LCAP will be the district's plan for the next three years and will be a guide to our district until the year 2024. Our committee's last meeting was Thursday, April 8th. Our LCAP committee would like to thank the school board for approving recent committee bylaw revisions. Those revisions allowed our committee to create and elect a student chair to be included on our LCAP leadership team. At our April 8th meeting, Keenan was elected to hold that position by a unanimous vote of the other LCAP student members. Our LCAP committee focused on the board's strategic framework and its four focus areas, which are also our district LCAP goals. Using four Zoom breakout rooms, LCAP members discussed various recommendations of items to be included in the district's plan from this year through 2024. Uh, I participated in focus group number one, connected school communities, and Keenan participated in focus group number three, uh, engaging academic programs. Uh, Keenan and I will uh, each reference a few recommendations discussed by our focus groups. In focus group one, there, will, there are three I will mention. Uh, one, create a West End community specific task force, which is targeted to need. Uh, the West End has some of the highest needs schools and has the lowest performing high school. Uh, two, continue the use of Zoom for advisory committee meetings, even after a return of in-person meetings. Attendance at some public meetings has actually increased because of access via Zoom. And three, uh, there are eight state priorities which must be addressed in LCAP. Um, parent engagement is state priority number three and parent engagement holds special relevance to the parent advisory committee. Uh, the California Department of Education requires use of a self-reflection tool for the evaluation of parent engagement. Uh, San Juan, our district gets to decide how many or from where parents are selected for doing the self-reflection of parent engagement. Our uh, third recommendation is some parents from every school site are represented in the reporting of uh, state priority number three. Uh, I will now give the floor to our student leadership chair, Keenan, to speak. Thank you, Tom. So like Tom mentioned, my name is Kenan. I'm actually a senior at Del Campo High School and I serve for the LCAP as the student chair. Uh, so based really based on my previous experiences and the findings that the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates have reported on students in our district's mental health and feelings of connection, the LCAP wants to make a recommendation to take a look at the amount of students per counselor at each site and work with district and site officials to create a plan to lower the amount of students per counselor by a significant percentage. The LCAP committee also recommends that the school district allows a student to serve on the school board. These recommendations will allow the San Juan Unified School District the opportunity to connect with the students it serves. At our May meeting, we look forward to working on drafts of our goals, actions, metrics, and expenditure information. We want to, take, we want to thank our LCAP director, Gian, and our LCAP specialist, Laura, 
for their support and assistance, and also to my fellow committee members. Thank you. We invite the board to ask any questions. Thank you both very much for the report. It, it was thorough. I can confirm that as the board representative to the LCAP PAC. Um, I will now turn it to my colleagues to see if there's any questions for either of our presenters. Okay, thank you very much. I, seeing none, thank you very much for the report. And I also um, want to thank Dr. McKibben for joining the last meeting as well. Um, the board was uh, thoroughly represented at the last meeting. And also, um, Kanan, thanks for uh, taking on the leadership role and, and being the first um, student co-chair. Thank you for your service as well. And thank you, Mr. Nelson, as well. We appreciate the report. Mr. Allen, do we have any other reports at this time? We do not, President Viasquez. Okay, then with that, we are at item E7. And there are no closed session actions to report at this time. So with that, we are at item F, visitor comments. Um, Mr. Allen, will you please give instructions to those in attendance via Zoom um, on how they can raise their hand if they have a comment at this time? Certainly, President Viasquez. This item is an opportunity for those individuals attending the meeting to offer comment on topics that are not on tonight's agenda. If your comment is related to an item on tonight's agenda, we would ask that you hold your comment until that item is called and public comment will be offered at that time. If you'd like to offer a comment on a topic that is not on tonight's agenda and have joined us on the Zoom environment, now would be the time to raise your hand. To do so, click the raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device or desktop Zoom client, or press star nine if you've dialed into the meeting tonight. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Do we have any general visitor comments at this time? We do have uh, several hands that have been raised at this time, President Viasquez. Okay, and I would like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes. The clock on the screen will count down the time. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda. So we're not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who will follow up with you. Uh, Mr. Allen, I will appreciate your assistance at this time in navigating us through our public comment. Certainly, President Viasquez. Our first comment will be from Mr. Ben Avey. Mr. Avey, when you're ready, sir. Thank you. Madam President, board members, and Superintendent Kern, parents are the voice of our children, both legally and morally. We are responsible for keeping them safe, healthy, and raising them to be good people. It's a solemn duty that we welcome without reward or compensation. In recent months, we have attempted to make our voice heard as the San Juan Unified School District made critical decisions about our children's education and success. We were ignored as the district proceeded without our input or feedback. As I shared at the last meeting, if your labor partners were treated the same way, it would not be tolerated. As our children's chief advocates, we cannot tolerate it either. Last week, a group of parents came together to form the San Juan Parents Association, a parent-led nonprofit that will advocate for the success and well-being of our children. San Juan Parents will achieve our mission through education, training, civic engagement, and other political action. While the organization is still forming, we have already prioritized the importance of full-time in-person learning and immediate transition to neighborhood-based elections. Please visit sanjuanparents.org or visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to learn more. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will come from Bill Selden. Uh, Mr. Selden, when you are ready. Can you hear me? We can. I'm sorry, I don't know how to work this, uh, this Zoom stuff. So my name is Bill Selden and I've been in contact with the school board, Mr. Kent Kern and they even emailed Bill Simmons and they were all copied. Uh, I'm here, I'm concerned like the previous uh, gentleman there. I, I don't know if you people realize that you're operating under the Healthy Schools Act, but yet you're 
be requiring teachers, bus drivers, various other uh, individuals to apply pesticides on campus, in school buses, and in classrooms. One of them is Oxivir 1. And the slick salesman may make you feel good because they say that it's, well, it's got hydrogen peroxide in it, when in fact, it has 0.5% hydrogen peroxide in it. And regular old hydrogen peroxide has 3%. It's the other ingredients in there that you ought to pay attention to. Uh, benzyl alcohol, uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, dodio, I can't even pronounce it, benzene, sulfonic acid, and hydrobenzoic acid. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna run out of time. Under the uh, state and federal law, you're required to train your employees before they ever touch a pesticide. They have not been trained. Uh, a gentleman that wrote back to me for uh, Mr. Kent Kern said that, uh, well, they'll get around to that basically. So, so anyway, parents that are sending their kids to school, you're liable to have them touching and breathing pesticides that are EPA registered. Teachers that are going to their classrooms requiring to be using these products, the bus drivers, uh, somebody needs to pay attention to this. I don't know I don't believe the governor has the authority to tell people to stand down and not pay attention to the law, but it is a law and you're not the only district in the state of California that's violating it, but it is a crime. So I was a licensed pest control advisor for 25 years by the state of California and I'm running out of time. So pay attention and don't make people sick, pay attention and uh, be safe. Thank you. And thank you for your comment, sir. Our next comment will come from Marina Gable when you are ready. <clears throat> Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Hello, my name is Marina Gable. Uh, myself, along with many other concerned parents, have started a recall of the San Juan Unified School Board. We are asking for help with the recall. We will need at least one lead parent from each school site in the district. That's about 60 parents to help us start collecting signatures. Please email me, all lowercase, recall sjusb at gmail.com. Again, all lowercase, recall sjusb at gmail.com. Uh, please check out our Facebook page as well, San Juan Unified School District Parents and Teachers for In-Person Learning. And um, we need you ASAP, please contact us. Again, recall sjusb at gmail.com. Thank you. And our next comment will come from Scott Rafferty. When you are ready, sir. Uh, hello, I'd like to follow up on uh, the comments Mr. Avey made about uh, neighborhood elections. In coming weeks, you'll also have an opportunity to sign a petition uh, to ask the County uh, Board of Education to require uh, neighborhood elections and to enlarge the size of the board to seven. Uh, a couple, this is long overdue, several months ago, Carolina Flores asked the board to produce um, all the documents related to a promise that was made in 2012 to study this issue. Uh, we got back one piece of paper. Fortunately, some conscientious employee provided a wealth of documents that were illegally withheld by the district, including a map which shows a district a, neighbor, a neighborhood trustee area for Citrus Heights and another one for West Arden Arcade that was actually majority non-white. For 10 years almost, you have sat on this. We heard the superintendent who knew all about this say that they were waiting for the 2020 census, which we told you a year ago was going to probably be the worst census in history especially for Latino and black communities. Uh, you need to comply with the law. You need to find out why the Public Records Act was violated and what the consequences are. You need to tell that to the community. 
It is not the case, as you suggested at your last meeting, that simply because there is litigation, you are excused from the law that permits your constituents from requiring you to agendize an item. It's time you answer these questions in public and not as some trustees have done in Democratic Party meetings. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment will come from Katie Reed. When you are ready. Good evening. My name is Katie Reed. Uh, during this COVID year, I've been struck by our community feeling that we really can do anything. <clears throat> Along with many lasts, there have also been a lot of firsts. Even after serving on eight PTA, PTSA, and PTO boards for my children over the years, I had somehow never prioritized participation in our school district board meetings. And I am grateful that the pandemic has made clear the importance of parent participation at this level. I have been working as an organizing member of the San Juan Parents Association, mentioned by Mr. Avey previously at www.sanjuanparents.org because what I have seen more than anything else academically this year is that parents need a voice at this table. We are not just the loud and affluent as Mr. Kern has labeled us. In fact, we created a survey ourselves to pull as many parents as we could possibly reach it was something that the district has refused to do at seemingly every juncture. I've heard, for example, an attempt to rush through a block schedule at Bella Vista High School is currently happening without a request for parent input. And that is very concerning to me. Please start listening to our voices. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next comment comes from Rob Hutchinson. When you are ready. Thank you, can you hear me now? We can, go ahead. This ties in so much to what I've heard. I met with, oh, well, good evening board president, executive cabinet, superintendent, board members and members of the public. I met with a couple members of executive cabinet last summer about concerns about inequities involving our students and the way they've been assigned to my particular school. I was told that the CDE recs are optional. More recently, I presented Ed Code Title V, Section 14030 to district about two weeks ago. I was sent an altered document, which I've repeatedly referred to as attachment one as justification that very few of our rooms would meet that standard and our site predates it. I have sought records relating to this document, the one that looks like a pan pa plan page but has blue numbers added to it that are incorrect. I have not heard from facilities about this, even though I've been presented with public documents that show that the assistant superintendent is aware of my concerns and questions. I've not heard from HR about this or the statement that we as a staff were told HR caps our enrollment at 2000, but it may swell to 2050 over the summer. I have though been suspended by text after 6 p.m. for no reason that I've yet been told. I've been pulled away from my 157 kids. I received a note hand delivered to my door jam by staff against my written wishes. I've caught another member of executive cabinet modifying a document before making it a part of public record. Attempts to gather more information have been blocked, yet I may be unilaterally fired by the person who I'm accusing of breaking the law and those others. And the board has been aware of all these concerns for some time. Thank you. And President Viasquez, that was our final comment. We are at item G, the consent calendar. Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments for items that are on the consent calendar? 
We have not received any written comments for the consent calendar. If you've joined us on the Zoom meeting and would like to offer a comment for an item that is on the consent calendar, now is your opportunity to do so. And seeing no hands raised at this time, President Viasquez. Do any board members wish to remove items from the consent calendar? Seeing none, um, there is a request from staff to pull item G2, the purchasing report. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, pull that at this time and request uh, a motion to approve items G1 and G3 through G8. It's been moved by Ms. Costa and seconded by Ms. Creason. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye, aye. that was unanimous. Um, I did pull item G2 from the consent calendar. Uh, Mr. Camarda, I believe you are with us, if you don't mind um, coming forward and, and explaining G2 to us. Yes, thank you, uh, President Viasquez. I appreciate you pulling that board out and I, and I apologize for the inconvenience of that. Uh, specifically on page three, uh, under general contracts, there's two things in front of the board. Uh, bid number 2116 MCM roofing and bid number 21-117 uh, for Pacific Shield roof services. Uh, those are placed on the board in, uh, uh, consent item incorrectly. Uh, it appears to be one contract uh, for each of these two different uh, uh, roofing companies. Um, we will be amending this and bringing it back to the board uh, on May 11th, uh, they should have been presented to the board for board consideration as uh, multiple contracts for each individual site. Uh, we will make those corrections uh, again and have those back on in front of the board for consideration at the next uh, scheduled board meeting. Uh, so just requesting that those two specific items are removed and then uh, G2 can move forward from there. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Camarda, for the explanation. So at this point, I'm going to um, see if my colleagues are okay moving the rest of G2 as amended to remove those two contracts that um, need to be revised. Is there a motion to approve item G2 as amended? It's been moved by Mr. Hernandez and seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Camarda. Thank you, board member. And with that, we are at our first business item, item I-1, Encina Middle School Development Update. Mr. Shoemake and team, please begin when you are ready. You're back there. All right, good deal. We can. Oh, there we go. Maybe it is going now. Can you go back? There we go. Like a good lesson plan, we'll adjust here. So, uh, good evening, President Viasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern, and Ms. Cunningham. Thank you for having us tonight. We're really excited to share our progress on the development of our new Encina Middle School. Joining me tonight are Dr. Shana Henry, our Encina Middle School principal, and Nina Mancina, who has continued in her role of supporting Encina as we plan our new middle school. Next slide, thank you. Our presentation tonight will cover five specific aspects of our work, with the focus really being on instructional, structural, and student community outcomes that have evolved from our design work. Next, next slide. Our work within Encina continues to build upon our district work related to continuous improvement. In a nutshell, how do we listen to, learn from, and respond to the needs of students, practitioners, and community members? As you recall, we're going to stay on that last slide there, Joseph, that's all right. As you recall, we first started planning for the creation of a new Encina Middle School in the spring of 2018. Our focus since, this, since that day has been to not look down at things from the top, but to listen, learn, and build from the ground up. And based on our learnings from the past, take the time needed to make the best decisions before moving forward. 
Our work has generated some significant input and learning, and I'm happy to share at this time that our default decision-making stance is anchored in student, staff, and community voice. Next slide. Thank you. As you are aware, for the past year, senior district staff and teacher union leaders have been available to provide support, advice, and guidance. While listening to the Encina staff, it became really apparent early on that the sponsorship team needed to be more actively engaged with the site leadership team. This district sponsorship team now meets twice a month with Dr. Henry and the Encina site leadership team to discuss issues act as a thought partner, and in general, remove barriers to Encina's success. At this time, I'm gonna have Nina Mancina now, who's gonna share with you our extensive work with our stakeholders. Good evening, it's nice to be here with you all in person this evening. Um, I would like to take an opportunity to provide you with a brief overview of the outreach we have done to date. Uh, the middle school design team presented to the staff three times and used the site's home group structure to gather feedback in small groups. Each home group was facilitated by a design team member and a member of the leadership team. Each session included a Google form so that staff could provide additional feedback outside the group session. The data gathered was used by the design team to make modifications to each prototype and answer any questions staff had. In the distance world, community outreach, outreach was difficult. We used several of the avenues indicated on the slide, including a partnership with Mutual Assistance Network. We ran a series of co-facilitated community forums that gathered information on the prototypes um, and turned out, the turnout at these events, sorry, excuse me, the turnout at these events was lower than we would have liked but we did get some good feedback around the connection of the school to the community, making sure Encina Middle School students experience the same activities as other students in the district and ensuring the safe environment for students. Safety, as you can imagine, was the number one concern I heard from parents I spoke with. In addition to student guides, the that each design team member identified, I was able to get into Zoom classrooms to have discussions with both current middle schoolers and fifth graders at Dyer Kelly Elementary School. Current middle schoolers were very interested in the possibility of increasing electives, access to organized sports and clubs and enrichment opportunities. They were also interested in learning more language, including Japanese, because many of them have a big love of anime. Um, and of course, they were want more choice in what their day looks like. Elementary students were concerned about discipline at the middle school level and the possibility of bullying. But they were also very excited about a new mascot and wanted to know what the school colors were going to be. They looked forward to picking their electives, being able to have science every day, and expanded access to clubs like cooking and robotics. As with other feedback, this information was provided to the design team for use in their development of their plan. I will now pass it to Dr. Shana Henry to provide you with details on the design plan. Good evening, President Viasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. I, I'm, I'm so honored to stand in person in front of you today to share an update for the new middle school. What I will share is the collective work of an incredible team that is our middle school design team. I could not be more proud of their work this year as we pushed our thinking and one another. What you will see tonight is reimagining the middle school experience for our future scholars. And while our design team partners are not here in person, they do stand virtually with me and present this update. Next slide, please. Before I go into some of the key design elements, it is important to know our work for the design process was grounded in research for what works for school success. And there were three key pieces of research we used to start our work. If I can draw your attention to the green boxes on the slide and join me in the middle where you will find the instructional core. This is a heart of the student learning experience where we create strong relationship between the teacher's knowledge and skill students' engagement in their own learning, and academically challenging content. When these three elements are working in harmony, we will have productive student outcomes. 
We also reviewed the work of Dr. John Hattie and his visible learning research. His work revealed which educational influences have the strongest effect on student achievement. As a design team, we reviewed his findings to embed in our work. And at the top of our slide, coherence. In order for success to be achievable and sustainable, we recognize all elements must work together toward a collective goal and with shared accountability. As a whole, we will engage in the cycle of continuous improvement as we plan, implement, monitor, and adjust our design work. Once we created a foundational base of research, our design team broke into two work groups, seen here in the bottom red boxes, to vision and outline the instruction and student experience while the other group explored interventions and supports. Next slide, please. What came from our work groups were action items that can be summarized in three components, instructional, structural, and student and community. Next slide, please. First, our structural components for our new design. Our school day will be a traditional six period day. However, a flex time block will be embedded within the day that will support timely intervention and enrichment. Using a web-based software platform, Scholars will have the unique ability to choose where they seek additional help, or teachers may select scholars to attend flex time based on recent formative assessments. We have also included an extended time block to our first period. This dedicated time will include opportunities to build community, engage in academic progress monitoring, and teacher and student collaboration for the aforementioned flex selection. Practitioners will serve as advocates and family partners for this core group of students. Knowing the need and value of collaboration and time to plan for our practitioners, we are building in two key features to the design. First, our master schedule will aim to have a common prep period for departments so they can collaborate should they choose to. But we have also added a 35 minute practitioner collaboration time to occur after scholar dismissal four days a week. This time will allow for discussions about individual student progress and instructional planning and data analysis. This will also create opportunities for cross-curricular collaboration, so we are building coherence across departments as well as within them. And finally, we are deepening our multi-tiered intervention and support system, MTSS, so we have resources in place for students that need more support with academic or social emotional pieces. Can you back up one for me? Thank you. Next are instructional components. As mentioned earlier, the research of the instructional core will serve as the base of quality teaching and learning. But we will also focus on teacher clarity, which is a high leverage influence listed in the visible learning research by Hattie. Teacher clarity is a method where practitioners are clear on what it looks like when students know and are able to do standards. Teaching is organized and intentional and students can better plan and predict where they are toward achieving mastery. We will also design grading practices that shift to a more equitable policy where grades accurately reflect a student's academic level of performance toward grade level standards. In order to truly focus on clarity and grading in a coherent system, we will devote time to mapping out formative assessment calendars, pacing guides and curriculum maps, and create accountability systems to monitor our professional structures and student progress. Finally, the flex time will be grounded in student progress data and the practitioner collaboration time. Next slide. And third, the student and community component. Our goal was to create supports that provide for an engaging culture that builds community and school pride. With the goal of students and staff feeling more connected to and involved with the community around them, our school will feature a house system where all students and staff will be assigned to one of four houses and throughout the year, engage in community building opportunities, events and competitions with other houses. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you will recognize this concept, but we are definitely elevating it to 2021 and with our scholars in mind. The names of our houses 
or altruismo, a Portuguese word that represents the house of givers. Amistad, a Spanish word that represents the house of friendship. Isabindi, a Zulu word that represents house of courage. And rever, a French word that represents the house of dreamers. To deepen relationships with scholars and families, we will continue the student-led conference model and we'll be adding the parent-teacher home visit project with a focus on our incoming sixth grade families. Through a variety of community building events, our school will serve as a welcoming and trusted place for all families. Knowing the developmental needs of our middle schoolers, we will stay consistent and structured with our positive behavior and supports process and with clear expectations and embedded social emotional supports throughout the day. We are also extremely excited to offer a variety of rich elective options that will begin in year one and will include art, Spanish, multimedia communications, journalism, AVID, leadership, and band. As we prepare for the upcoming separation of the 612 model, our current staff was presented with updates on designs from both middle school and high school. During the week of April 12th, staff were provided the opportunity to rank their staffing preference of middle school, high school, or opting out of either site. In the last week, HR reviewed staff selections and placed practitioners at high school or middle school levels. Next slide. Another exciting part of our design work has included the naming process for our new school that met the district criteria for middle schools of a great name. In March, we did a general call for ideas, reaching out to our community, feeder schools, staff, and students. Communication blasts were also included on our website and social media channels. Our design team reviewed the submissions and ultimately we landed on two names that we felt were great role models for our scholars. In addition, both names are historic women of color that have made important contributions to our nation and world. In the last week, we've had over 300 participants provide feedback on both names. And in the weeks to come, we will go through the stages of presenting at the District Facilities Committee, Executive Cabinet Review, and finally to you, our distinguished Board of Education for approval. It is our hope to have a name by the end of the school year as we solidify our school identity. Next slide, please. As we prepare for our official opening in fall, we still have a lot to do. We are planning to bring Where Everyone Belongs or WEB program to welcome our new sixth graders to campus by a group of eighth grade leaders. That relationship will continue throughout the year. Orientations will be planned for all families to learn about the school and the design elements mentioned tonight. Additional community meetings and outreach will take place as well so families can get to know our staff. We recognize that while this is an exciting time, change is very difficult. So connecting and communi communicating is a top priority as we transition. We are also planning the first few weeks of school that will include celebration, community building, and house identification. And of course, we invite all board members to join us so you can also be part of the house. Finally, staff will have the opportunity for professional development and collaboration to start strong. And our design team will continue the work through the lens of continuous improvement. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Jim to talk about facilities preparation for the new year. As Dr. Henry shared, there's some exciting instructional, structural, and student community work taking place at Encina Middle School. And that work is responsive to the needs of our students, our practitioners, and our community members. And we've taken that same approach to listen and to listening and responding as we have planned the facility utilization for next year. Of note, we are creating a separate middle school office on the north side of the campus. We are establishing separate drop-off and pickup areas for middle school and high school students. We are staggering our bell schedules between the middle and high schools, and we are reimagining re path of travel and room utilization. And each of these moves is designed to intentionally maximize daily contact between students of similar grades and reduce interactions between middle school and high school students throughout the day. And speaking of high school, 
there we go. Uh, while th it is not the focus of tonight's presentation, we wanted to highlight some important work they are engaged in. Superintendent Kern is going to take on this slide. Thank you, Mr. Shoemake and, and Dr. Henry and Nina. I just wanna say thank you so much for uh, the presentation and the work that you've done. Um, what you see tonight is there is similar work going on with the high school, but as Dr. Henry has been here this year, really shepherding that work with middle schools. Just recently, we hired a new principal for the high school that occurred in April. And you can see the various timelines here, but what we wanted to share, this really was about the middle schools, but we, the middle school portion of that community, we wanted to highlight, you'll see something very similar come back with a rollout that will be about the structures as that leadership team there is working through that process as well. Um, some of the things are already in process. Others will be in place in the fall. Uh, but we wanted to just take a quick snapshot to highlight that that work is continuing to go on. And we will come back again and see a very similar presentation specifically to the high school at a later date. And with that, Board President Viasquez, I'll turn it over to you and the board for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, before we go to board members' questions and comments, I'm gonna check in with Mr. Allen really quick and see if there's any public comments on this item at this time. If you've joined us on the Zoom and would like to offer a comment, now is your opportunity by clicking that raise hand button. We have no submitted comments on this item. And I do have one hand at this time, President Viasquez. Okay, um, Mr. Allen, I invite you to, um, have our one public commenter speak at this time. Our comment will come from Anna Quinones. Uh, Ms. Quinones, when you're ready. Hola, buenas noches. Thank you so much for taking my, my comment. Um, I am a teacher at Encina High School and I am just so proud of the work that has been happening this school year. And, um, and and that, as you all saw, it's it's really exciting and amazing work, and it feels really good to be there. I just wanted to to say kudos to um, to my colleagues and to my supervisor. Thank you so much. And thank you for the comment. And that is our only comment at this time, President Viasquez. Okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. Do any board members have questions or comments at this time, Mr. Hernandez? <clears throat> Thank you for the report. It was outstanding. Dr. Henry, it's good to see you in person. And um, I have two quick questions. Dr. Henry, when you're assigned to a family, are you, do you stay with that family throughout your time at the middle school or do you switch? How does that work? Are you talking about the extended first period? No, you say that, you, you know, the, the six family that you're, the, the houses, I apologize, houses. I said how the houses that you're assigned to, do you stay with that? Yes, house? The, the intent is that it will be a three year family that's developed over time with new students coming in and joining the house. Okay, great, thank you. I mm -hmm. think that's an outstanding concept, by the way. And my second question is the, uh, the, 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 the HR reviewed staff selections in place, part, part, practitioners at the high school, middle school, did, did everyone go get what they wanted or how did that work out? You wanna take that one? That's a that's a nuanced question. I, uh, so we did have, I believe we had three staff members that opted out, and so they received what they want. The middle school and high school, uh, everyone was placed at a middle school or high school selection to what they want. We still have three, I think two or three vacancies right now that are there that we are trying to fill, and they are talking internally about could they fill those internally or not. So yes everyone got placed you know i think it's hard for anyone that's been at a 612 for so long to all of a sudden have to leave your middle school kids or to leave your high school kids so everyone got what they wanted but at the end of the day they're they just got big hearts and it's hard to walk away from so it's not easy to make that decision thank you yeah. that's it for me miss costa and actually what Mr. Shoemake just said. First of all, thank you for the report. It, and it is great to see you in person. And it's great to see you, Nina, back again. Um, I have heard that there's a level of sadness. Everybody agrees that it was time to separate. But there's a level of sadness for some people, both staff members and students, and even some parents, that 
there is a change coming and change is difficult, especially in this year of pandemic. We experienced it when we did school closure and helping people to realize, say goodbye to what they had and get ready for what's coming. Have we had any conversations about how to address those feelings with our staff and our students? <laughs> so I, there's a there's a saying that I use with our middle school team all the time, and it's if you're unpredictable, you're unpleasant. And I think what has happened is mixed with that sadness is just this: they've gone through a year of COVID at the same time while they're trying to plan a school, and there are so many moving parts that I've been in, and I, we've been involved in so many meetings that are happy, then emotional, then angry, then back to happy. And so it's, I think it's an evolution. And I, I honestly think that's where the stance that we're going to be in for quite some time until we really start to nail things down. I think in August, when those first kids show up on the campus and they're placed in their houses and everyone can take a deep breath, we're all back and, and dive into this. I think that that, that sadness, that anxiety, that unpleasantness is going to, well, I know it's going to be minimized. I hope that answers your question. Oh, yeah. Costa, I will also add that we know that we're still going to be on the same physical plant next year. And so that 612 bond doesn't end with this split. So we are looking ways for the high school students to work with our middle school students, for our um, staff to engage in some professional development together. So we're looking at opportunities to keep that as a seamless family, if you will. And is that being conveyed so people know that that is the plan? I, I would say it's still part of the design work of how it's actually going to land, but it's very present on both design teams on how to keep that continuation going. And then in terms of the facility, have we conveyed to the parent community the facility changes that are taking place and how we feel that addresses the safety issue? And have we talked to the incoming parents I'll take the take on the I'll be the face of the facilities here for <laughs> um, so yeah there's been extensive communication that's going forward but as part of this design work there's so many aspects of this that have not been shared publicly until it comes to the board the staff just got selected so there's going to be ample time here in the coming weeks for them to begin what is the communication plan how are we going to explain drop off and the office that we're building for the middle school team hasn't even begun construction. That week that school gets, that day that school gets out, the following week is you're going to see a, a flurry of activity on that campus where um, staff move into the middle school and high school classrooms to try to visibly separate the uh, construction that's going to take care of the north end of the campus um, to, to ensure that we have a, a uh, stable and dedicated office for the middle school team will, will occur at that point. And then once once that is and signage is in place, we can really kind of, I think, get a little bit more specific with our communication. Thank you again to the team. I really appreciate it. Ms. Creason? Yeah. I want to just start by saying it's so good to see you two, two of my favorite <laughs> humans, and you too, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I see you more often. Um, I just appreciate your approach so much in your spirit. You know, it just, it just really uplifts me. It really lifted my spirits and I needed it. So I appreciate that. I think the house idea is amazing and I would love to be assigned a house. And so please send me the details. I would love to be a part of that. Um, I did have a question. Can you share the two names that has come down to or no? Wait, it's public already. If, if you weren't going to, I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it ask, I figured. If not, I totally understand. Yeah. They're great. Oh, gosh, I hope I don't mess this up. Okay. <laughs> the, the two names that we are considering at the moment are Rosa Parks <gasps> and Katherine Johnson. Wow. I'm sorry. Like, no, Rosa. Maya, Maya Angelou. Angelou. I'm so sorry, Maya Angelou. That was one of the names that were submitted. So Maya Angelou 
and Katherine Johnson. I messed that up, Superintendent Kern. I'm no, so it sorry. It was recently <laughs> narrowed to two. Spot. It was a much broader field, but it's Maya Angelou and Katherine Johnson, which is very exciting. Yes. Yeah, there was there was many, many names. Many I mean, names. there was a whole process they went through. Um, and I, I love that you the, the list that kind of came forward were women of color who had real impact in in society in their communities mm -hmm. and then through really community and student in that whole process it was drawn down to those two and then ultimately um it's been an interesting conversation about whose decision is this you know is it ultimately going to come to the board the board decide and i said the truth of the matter is the board has always respected the the voice of the community and when you have students and staff which is happening where they're coming forward with one i believe it's mm -hmm. 70 30. Yes. Now we're not going to say that tonight yet, but it's it's pretty clear because I think they're still maybe collecting and gathering some input. Um, but that will come back to the board, taken to the facilities committee first um, next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So when it comes back to the board, they'll have had the opportunity to see it. That's the normal process we go through. And then it will come back to the board for you to ultimately take action on it. And it will be exciting to have a name for yes. the school. Um, are you colors? You said school colors. Are those that it's going out for vote in the next week or two with our kids? See, I love school it. School colors and mascot. I love, so really, totally student voice. Mm -hmm. Love it. Me too. It's just really, really exciting, and just you know, to get that not just buy-in, but you know, pass the ownership on. It's like this is your school, children. I mean, it just I I know it's going to mean a whole lot. Um, to the community building, you know, as this change occurs. It's just really exciting. Um, I wanted to also just say, just in general, the part of the presentation where you explained the community outreach process that you partnered with mutual assistance and all the things that did take place is wonderful. I know that I was getting a whole lot of calls at the beginning of this conversation. Um, you know, people wanted to be involved and they have been, you know, and I haven't got any calls. So it seems like things are going well <laughs> so on this topic. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. Um, I did want to just clarify one point. It's my understanding that the facilities, facilities plan that was shared tonight is in stone for, or in, we're talking about just the next school year. There's another plan that will, is being worked out for beyond next school year. Is that, I just want to clarify that. That is correct. Okay. Thanks for all that you all do. I appreciate you very much. Chris, and I think a good point related to the facilities is, and, and we've talked about this a couple of times, we kind of have to know the vision and where they're going before we can ultimately design what it will be in the end. And I think even through the process, uh, a good example you saw on the slide about high schools, them talking about um, electives or CTE. There could be some choices that are made that, like, I mean, look at some of our high schools where we've done our signature projects and based on the program they offer, what the projects look like. And so I think as we get more and more information around that, that will help us generate decisions around the facilities as well. Would you agree, Dr. Henry? I would agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. McKibben. Um, Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Nina, it's nice to see you once again. Uh, uh, Dr. Henry, it's nice to uh, talk to you. I still remember the conversation we had mm -hmm. and the energy that you exhibited there and, you, and clearly that energy continues to exude uh, out of uh, where we're going here. I do have a few questions uh, for clarification. Um, for example, you, you talked a little uh, a bit about the connection to high school students. One of the things that was mentioned on the first page was the mixed feelings that some of the uh, middle school students had about uh, losing that, that connection. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how those mixed feelings uh, uh, were, came into your thinking a, a, as you move forward and, and uh, some, maybe perhaps some other examples where high school students uh, uh, and, Nina, and the, the, uh, the family yeah. feel was uh, continued on? Since you've gathered the feedback, do you want to talk about just how that was brought to the design team? Yeah, I think that um, Dr. Henry did speak to the fact that we're making some conscious uh, choices between high school and middle school to keep those connections. 
but in terms of to the design team, as I mentioned, all the information and data that I, I put together was brought to the design team. So as they were working on their pieces of what they wanted to put in the design, they incorporated that information um, that they got from students. So that's where sort of this idea of making the connections between middle school and high school and keeping that together, um, especially because we have a lot of students who come from the same family. So, you know, how we're gonna um, basically keep those connections between students, students as well. So I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see um, at the high school as it proceeds in its design and we build some of those components about um, the connections between the students as well. So hopefully that answered your question. There's still a lot of conversation going on about that. Um, did I get at what you were trying to ask him for? I'm sorry. Did I get at yes, what you were asking? That was good. <laughs> I, I want to follow up a little bit on that. Uh, one of the things that I was impressed with in, in, in your write up too was there were clearly some examples of things that, that seem uh, that are, are working. Uh, for example, student led conferences that I think nearly all of us uh, on, on the board have participated in and have always been really impressed uh, with those sort of things. And, and uh, I appreciate that those things look like they're continuing forward uh, uh, into, into the new uh, program and, and so forth. So it, are, there, are there any other examples like that that you can think of where you uh, deliberately have included things that, that seem particularly successful in the, uh, as you move forward? Okay, we're playing tag team here. <laughs> So Dr. McKibben, I'm new to Encina, so uh, everything will be new to me, <laughs> but I know uh, both design teams are very interested in not throwing away everything. So a lot of the community building connections, that first period extended portion of the day will be um, similar to what they call the advocacy program. So right. still that connection between teacher and students and families. So some of those things are continuing along. Okay, thank you. And uh, my last one, oh, in terms of as you reach out, I remember a, uh, a scatter plot map that we saw some time ago showed uh, how th the number of students that were in the Encina area, um, how are you contacting those people uh, that look like they have, uh, have uh, have gone to other schools and and that may uh, uh, see uh, the resident school as in the Encina area being uh, interested in and what would someone have to do in order to show interest? Sure. So that's there's quite a few questions in there. So I'll try. Yeah, I'm sorry. To, yeah. No, no worries. So the the I think to the the first point is I don't think we have any interest in going out and trying to take kids from the middle school that they're in. In fact, the middle schools have all said that Encina's success is our success. Um, and so we wanna do what we can to support. And there's gonna be an effort to, to make sure that kids, before we are moving kids into a Churchill or an, or an, or an arcade, is just asking if, if their home school of residence is Encina, or do you know what you're leaving? Or do you know what, why you're leaving? The other piece is now that we now that um, we know what Encina Middle School is going to look like, it makes the job of our central enrollment people so much easier when they when Shane is going to be able to sit down with our central enrollment team and explain basically what is going to happen out there. So when when a family comes in and says, "I heard," or there's a rumor that 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 people at the central enrollment can stop them and correct that and say, "Have you do you, are you aware of what's going on out there?" and even speak to it. And, and really assure people rather than just allowing someone to come in and say, I'd like to transfer out and making that process easier than maybe it needs to be. We still wanna honor choice, but we wanna make sure that people understand the really Im impressive work that's taking place at this campus and um, steering them back to make sure they're making an informed decision. I think I got all your- uh, yeah, Thank you. Okay. Thank you very oh, much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, Shane, uh, Dr. Henry does have one more item to add to that. This is like a, a dance up here. Um, also, we're just developing strong feeder relationships. So reaching out to our elementary schools, 
um, our, our highly populated ones that students come from Greer, Howe, Dyer Kelly, just building those relationships with them so we can reclaim some of those students that may have thought that they were going to other schools, trying to reinvent the school and get them to know about these new elective options that they wanted to see, some of the new opportunities that we have available to them so that we can bring our kids back home to where they should be. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for um, for the presentation and for the discussion. I have just a couple of um, comments and questions. I will try to order them into questions and then comments. But one thing that stood out to me on slide 10 was just kind of in discussing the instructional components, the equitable grading practices. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about what that looks like in comparison to what we're doing, what, what's existing now there. Sure. So this is going to be a, a long three-year process, I think, and beyond to really crack at this grading process. But um, this was the concept of our design teams coming together and saying, we really want to focus on progress in the academic standards and not on maybe some non-instructional things that get into grading sometimes. So really looking at how that affects students and that grade reflecting more of a picture of progress in that mastery rather than where they are at a certain point of time based on assessments at that point of time, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I really appreciate yeah. the, the context around that. That's super helpful. I also appreciate kind of just how things are laid out in terms of the structural components, the instruction, the structural instructional, <laughs> and then the student and community components. On the structural components, um, um, you know, I love the the sense of um, camaraderie that's being built with the houses, and you know, it's very much a sense of belonging, right? Where everyone belongs, the web web welcoming activities, and I just particularly when we're talking about the structural components, I'm just wondering if you could speak to a little bit about where the um, non certificated staff play into this, because I, I I know it's intended to be a comprehensive. Um, a plan and effort. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to a little bit more about where um, that those staff members play a role and are part of this. Yeah, absolutely. So in all of these elements, we we think of it as a unified school staff effort. So we, we have classified staff on our design team as well to make sure that we're not neglecting any partners in that work, but they will be part of a house as well. That's we're hoping great. they can embed in the web work. So they will be very present through everything we do. Fantastic. Um, I have been watching the naming process and it's been really, really like, I really am curious what the result will be, but I've watched it narrow down and it's been really hard to not engage and participate myself. But I think no matter what, it's going to be really exciting. And so um, it's been a joy to watch that process and I look forward to seeing it through, through the end. And then, um, I just, I also appreciate, I know it's kind of a, a tricky balance of kind of discussing this work and watching it move along and then um, having kind of the high school component, but I think through the discussions and, and you all probably know, it's a full ecosystem of, of students that exist there. And yes, we're separating them, but there's still a lot of hopefully kind of um, shared support services and some other items there. And so I, I just want to express that it's my hope that as this moves along so quickly, because they're part of that shared ecosystem, that we continue to really um, keep an eye on the high school progress side as well. I don't want one to get too mm -hmm. far ahead of the other because I just think it's really important that they complement each other. Otherwise, like it just it won't be coherent. And I think that's what we're trying mm -hmm. to build, and that's critical to to the success here. And so. I'm excited that you know it's we have um, another presentation coming to May 25th. I think it's probably too premature to ask for even an update in June, so we'll, we'll have that. But just know that I'm really curious to see how these play out and inform each other in terms of processes and how they roll out. Um, other than that, I just want to express my thank you. Fantastic to see you. Appreciate all of the incredible work happening. Um, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are at item I2, COVID-19 update. Superintendent Kern. Thank you, President Viasquez, members of the board. Um, this is an ongoing item that we will have. 
Some weeks we may have a lot to update, other weeks we do not. This is one of these updates where there are weeks where there really isn't much to update as there really haven't been any significant changes in guidelines. Uh, we do want to, as the community is well aware and students spoke to this week, we started back with four days a week this week. Um, I will share with you that the percentages of students uh, returning to in-person did not change significantly. We are still seeing about 24% um, about of our elementary students are in cohort C, about 33% of our middle school students and 39% of our high school students. That was the same as when we came back for two days. With a district total, right around 29% of our students are still in um, distance learning. I would say that is a significantly lower, lower number than some of the other districts in the region for whatever reasons. Um, we had SPAC last week, and one of our items was about the fall. And I think the term that we're trying to use for the fall is a return to pre-COVID conditions, which is clear that prior to COVID, we were five days a week full time. We're still looking at options for folks who would choose not to come back as we still hear that, that there would need to be um, that option for some. So that's a process that we're continuing to work through. We're actually waiting for some clarification from the legislature and the governor as well on that as really what could be allowed. Uh, they wanna make sure that it's not the default. I completely agree, but they are hearing loud and clear that there is a need for still some options. So as we get more information on that in the coming weeks, We'll bring that to the board, but that's all that we have to update for you tonight. And Thank I can you, answer Kern. any questions. Thank you, Superintendent Kern. Um, Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments on this item? We do have one hand raised, and if you have joined us on Zoom tonight and would like to offer a comment, now would be your chance to do that by clicking that raise hand button. Uh, and we can start whenever you're ready, President Vasquez. Fantastic. Just as a quick reminder, public comments are limited to two minutes, and we'll go ahead and get kicked off with our public commenter. Thank you. Thank you. Our first comment will come from Mr. Ben Avey. When you're ready, sir. Thank you, President Viasquez, board members. Uh, on behalf of the San Juan Parents Association, I wanted to respectfully request the community engagement team start a series of community outreach and engagement meetings similar to what was done with uh, equity conversations in the district last summer. I think right now is a great opportunity to speak with parents and families to talk about the current distance learning models and really understand why parents are choosing uh, to stay in cohort C. I think that we can all make some assumptions, but I think it would be good to have those conversations with folks right now. Uh, and the district luckily has a very robust community engagement team that has done this work before. Uh, they could even do it virtually. So uh, while we know that the district's plans are as stagnant as uh, they will be for a while, um, I think we've heard we're gonna remain in the current learning model through the end of the year. I think this is the opportunity to be very proactive uh, in hearing from parents. Uh, I do know that there is an ongoing thought exchange that's out there regarding learning loss. Um, I would say that that is, that is different than the conversation about distance learning, just so that the district is fully aware of where parents are when they get the information from the state on what is possible uh, versus what we should really strive for. So thank you very much for your time. And I would say that we absolutely support a return to pre-COVID uh, conditions. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. And that is our only comment on this item, President Viasquez. Okay, at this time, I will turn it to my colleagues. Do any board members have questions or comments? Ms. Costa? I just wanted to say a sincere thank you to Frank Camarda, Cherie Chenoweth, and a legion of dedicated classified employees who worked to get our desks assembled at night and on the weekends and during the day and then delivered to school sites. I really didn't think it was possible to get 7,485 desks delivered, actually assembled and delivered, but they did it. And they did it before Monday, um, which is fantastic. Also a thank you to our vendors, because again, when with as much difficulty as we're hearing to get 
school related supplies. It was amazing to get that many deaths. And also a thank you to our principals and our teachers and classified employees who totally reworked their schedules and protocols and systems and plans in a matter of weeks to get things ready for kids. I've heard nothing but positive from all staff members and parents who've reached out to me. It's really been a great third transition, actually fourth trans, fourth first day of school this school year. So uh, hats off to everybody who made it happen. Ms. Creason. I echo Ms. Costa's sentiments, you know, everyone that made it happen, it was hard. <laughs> Pandemics are hard and I get it, you know, workplaces were changing quite a bit, but I also want to recognize parents because it is hard. <laughs> it was hard. It's hard to get kids to school in the middle of the day and figure it out. And a lot of people are just figuring it the heck out and stepping up as parents and doing what we can. Um, and it's hard. And for the kids that had to go through so much transition and man, the kids, I mean, I'm really inspired by the resiliency in children um, to just figure, not to say everyone's having a cakewalk, they're not, but um, the spirit when I visit Zoom rooms or talk to kids, it's, it's amazing. And so, you know, um, it really is everybody. It's all stakeholders that make it work and it's hard for everybody. And I'm really appreciative of where we're at. Um, this year is going to be how it is. And I think it's a lot better than it was definitely four months ago. And I'm really excited that, you know, next year, next school year, it will be, you know, I don't want to say pre-COVID. I get why we're saying pre-COVID. I think that we can even be better than pre-COVID. <laughs> so I'm going to think of some language to use, but definitely have our kids on campus for more time. So thanks for everybody. Thanks to everybody that has just hung in there to do the best that we can for kids and learning. Thank you for um, the update. It's kind of refreshing to hear that there was no significant changes in guidance. <laughs> um, but I know, I know it has not been easy. I got to visit a, a school today and be on campus and it was just, like soul refreshing. I don't know how else to describe it, but um, you know, seeing students in classrooms, that's that's where they that's where they belong. And um, I know it took a lot of work on behalf of so many to to make it happen and to um, our our staff in particular, from the instructional staff to the facility staff, um, to our transportation staff, to our nutritional staff. Um, Thank you for continuing time and time again to, um, to rise to, to the occasion. And I was just thrilled to uh, be on campus and see our students there. Um, was super impressed with um, the compliance around masks. Um, our students oftentimes I think have adopted it more a little bit more easily than some of um, than some of the adults in our school communities. But um, I'm super confident we're going to get through. We're going to make it to the end of the year, um, and then you know look forward look forward to the fall. I do want to um, just note that. I keep a pretty close eye on our COVID dashboard. And I know we've seen a little bit of traffic around youth sports. So Mr. Kern, I was wondering if you could just speak to a little bit on, on that piece and kind of what we're seeing in terms of rates. Yeah, we have seen um, some significant numbers of students who have had to be isolated or quarantined. Uh, I think two weeks ago, we had two high schools with over a hundred students quarantined at one time. Um, last week, I think we had one. I looked yesterday, we had one that wasn't on last week that was on a couple weeks ago that's back again with over 100 students. So I, the, the sports are creating some unique challenges for us um, in terms of the interactions and exposure. Um, we knew that was likely to happen. Uh, again, the fact that we are and I, and I said this to the SPAC meeting, there are some large urban districts in our region that are not playing sports yet. They haven't, they really haven't figured out how to implement the testing piece yet. To, to they may be practicing, but you don't have to do all the testing. So I'm happy that we're allowing those sports to participate, um, but we are seeing some students that are needing to be isolated because of that. And we'll probably, you know, continue to see that for the rest of this year. 
And, and I think, and you probably know this better than I do, heading into the fall, a lot of those testing components will probably continue in the fall. Um, as the vaccine gets available to more and more younger students, hopefully we'll see less teams having to be isolated uh, because as Mr. Hernandez and I have talked about this year, there, there haven't been any playoffs or, you know, it's, it's, they've been able to play the games, but I think they're hoping to have a regular season next year. And you could really see teams affected um, by one positive case and the cancellation of possibly a football game. They're not going to stop the rest of a postseason for that or something like that. So we'll continue to put a lot of those safety protocols in place and be ready for whatever lies ahead of us. Thank you. And that's pretty consistent with what we're seeing um, statewide. Um, children remain the biggest group in population that are not eligible for vaccines. And so until, you know, and I know science is moving as quickly as they can, but uh, as long as, as that's the case, I think we'll continue to um, see that. So I think it's just um, appropriate to continue with caution as we have been. So I know it doesn't come easily. I know it's a big lift, but I really appreciate it because I'm, I'm glad that our um, students are able to participate and um, couple together a bit of a season here through the end of the year. Um, I saw a couple of uh, hands come up, so I am going to um, go to Mr. Hernandez and then I'll turn it to you, Dr. McGibbon. Thank you, Ms. Fiasquez. Mr. Kern, since we're talking about this, could you just... Uh, some of the parents that have asked about the two sport rule, we, I know they get a very good explanation. I've seen the response to them, but I don't think the community at large kind of understands the why our approach and why we chose to do that. Can you briefly update our parents community on that, please? Yeah, and I, I used an example with, and I'll use it with the community tonight with an email that I sent to the board, because, and, and it's not any secret that right now Bella Vista has 108 students that are quarantined. If if we allowed students to play multiple sports, and let's say, you know, Ms. Creason, Mr. Hernandez, and I all played basketball on the same team. Well, if we're only playing one sport and we test positive, then our basketball team has to be quarantined. But if Ms. Creason plays soccer, now the soccer team has to be quarantined. If Mr. Hernandez plays baseball, which I know you did back in the day, you know, now all of a sudden the baseball team's quarantined. And if I play football, now all of a sudden all four of those teams are quarantined instead of one, I get this. I have a son who was a three, three sport varsity player. His last two years, he played three varsity sports. It, it would have been difficult, but I would have rather seen him be able to participate in one than affect all three. And even the likelihood of the exposure to the other students than bringing that to those sports. Um, and so I, I know people aren't happy about it, but it is allowing hopefully some of those sports to get in many more games than they would have otherwise. Dr. McKibben. Just quickly, and actually this is for both the both the, uh, board member Hernandez. <laughs> I get it. No, uh, <laughs> I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just uh, ask the question. Uh, uh, do we have any reason to or any plan to do a kind of a systematic uh, vaccination of our students in a similar way that we did for our teachers. That has not been a discussion at this point at, at my level. Um, I can speak just a little bit. I'm gonna, if I could physically put on a different <laughs> yeah. hat really quick, although I'm going to remain here at the dais, obviously. Um, there has been discussions at the state level on kind of how to roll that out. I think there's an expectation that at least through um, August that we'll be able, um, that there will be authorization to go as young as 12. Um, and it's my personal hope that that happens before the next school year. But I know there's been um, some, there's definitely preparations underway right now on what that looks like in terms of kind of rollout and in ensuring um, quick access. And there's plenty of experience to build on as we've rolled out vaccines um, since January. And so I think from the statewide level that planning is happening. I, am you know, but, district by district yeah. level, we haven't quite gotten there yet. But the, what, what we did related to the, you know, the 5,000 employees that we have and how impressive that was that it serves as a model of something we might want to consider if indeed we think that getting uh, students va uh, vaccinated and 
and having uh, partners with people like Dignity and that sort of thing might be something that is worth uh, looking at. And I think that's probably likely. The good thing is I don't think we're going to be in the same situation as we were in February in terms of fighting over inventory. Um, and so I think partnerships like that will come a lot easier um, and um, be a little bit smoother. And so that's kind of me speaking with my state at. <laughs> I, I, I would put probably where I would look at it a little differently is we were able to do something for our adults and employees. And we know most of all those adults and employees have vehicles and access. I think where I would look at it differently is how do we go out into the communities regionally and you know, President Viasquez and Ms. Chris and I have had these conversations about taking it to those communities. I think that's more likely to happen on a smaller scale than an event like we did at the center of the unit at the district that may, you know, some people may be able to get there very easily, but there may be others that wouldn't. So that's probably, and again, that this discussion, I mean, I, we talk weekly with the superintendents in the county, and this isn't a discussion we've had yet because I think we're still focused on getting the, the vaccine for the adults. And with it only being at 16 at this point, it, it just hasn't arisen. And, and we even haven't had any of our partners reach out to us yet on that as, as well. And I just, um, I got, particularly around February, so much of how that was stood up was driven by folks said that they had supplies. So we said, we got to go. We'll, we'll go where we can make it happen. Um, where we're moving statewide, we're slowly moving into the phase where vaccine uptake is probably going to slow down because we've already kind of saturated so many of the eligible adult populations. And so I just think um, with supply not being as big of a challenge, this community approach will be a lot easier to implement. And I think um, just kind of be handed down, we'll continue to work in partnership with the county and our other partners, but it'll just come a little bit easier than it did at the beginning of this calendar year. I'm going to do a quick search. Seeing no further questions or comments. Thank you, Superintendent Kern. With and that, President, President Viasquez, before you move on, we did have a couple of hands that went up for public comment, it looks like, as you were discussing. So I'd just like to remind folks that once we call public comment for an item, we unfortunately do not offer a second comment period for that specific item, but you are more than welcome to offer your comment at the end of the meeting during the general public comment period as well. Thank you, Mr. Allen. We do have um, item L, visitor comments. And so uh, we look forward to hearing at, at hearing from you at that point. Um, with that, we are at item I3, the San Juan Professional Educators Coalition, initial proposal for successor contract 2021-2022. Mr. Shoemake. Good evening, President Viasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. I'm here tonight to present the San Juan Professional Educators Coalition proposal for the 2021-2022 reopeners. The proposal was presented to the board for discussion on April 13th. And at this time, I can attempt to answer any questions on their behalf if needed. Thank you, Mr. Shoemake. As you noted, this item was presented at um, our last meeting on April 13th. Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments on this item at this time? We've had no comments submitted for this item and we do not have any hands raised at this time. Okay, do any board members have questions or comments? Seeing none. <clears throat> Seeing none. I apologize, I think I might be <laughs> missing a, a page, but this is for action. Uh, it, actually, when they submit their interest, it's just discussion, discussion. We only act on when, when we submit the district's interest. Well, that would explain why it has been, I thought maybe I was kind of yeah. missing a page. I no. apologize. All right, no well, there has been no um, discussion. So do one more quick check, seeing none. We are then at item I-4, uh, the California School Employees Association, initial proposal for successor contract 2021-2022. <clears throat> Yes, Mr. I'm also, also here tonight to present the California School Employees Association Chapter 127 proposal for the 2021-2022 reopeners. Their proposal was also presented to the board for discussion on April 13th. 
At this time, I can attempt to answer any questions on their behalf if needed. Thank you, Mr. Shoemaker. Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments on this item? We've not had any comments submitted, nor do we have any hands raised at this time. Okay, I will turn it to my colleagues for any um, questions or comments at this time. Doing a quick check? Nope. Okay, thank you. And um, public comment slash action is anticipated on May 11th. With that, we are at item, oh, we are at item I-5, implementation of agreements with SJTA, CSCA, SJPEC, supervisors and Teamsters, um, Mr. Shumate, go ahead. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm here tonight to present the side letters of agreements with the San Juan Teachers Association, the California School Employees Association, Chapter 127, the San Juan Professional Educators Coalition, Teamsters Local 150, and the San Juan Supervisors Association. At this time, I can answer any questions if needed. Thank you, Mr. Shumate. Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments at this time? We have had one comment submitted for this item at this time. Okay, uh, just a quick reminder, public comments are limited to two minutes. Uh, Mr. Allen, please um, have our public comments begin when you're ready. Uh, this is a written submitted comment, uh, which reads, the agreement for the compensation for combination class teachers leaves out many teachers with multi-age classrooms. Even though the multi-age classrooms left out of the agreement are a component of the design of various programs, such as SDC and the Montessori program, the teachers in those multi-age classrooms were still required to put in extra hours to develop curriculum during the distance learning and hybrid time to meet the needs of all the grade levels, just as a combo teacher in a traditional program had to do. All teachers who teach multi-age and combination classrooms should be eligible to receive the one-time compensation for the work they did. Please amend the SLA regarding combination classroom teachers to include all multi-age classrooms across the district. And that is our only comment for this item, President Viasquez. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Do any board members have questions or comments at this time? Seeing none. Okay, this item will return for action um, on May 11th. So we are at item I-6, implementation of agreements with SJAA cabinet confidential unrepresented. Mr. Shoemaker. Yeah. Lastly, I'm here tonight to present the agreements with San Juan Administrators Association, Cabinet, Confidential, and our unrepresented groups. And at this time, I can answer any questions if needed. Thank you, Mr. Shoemaker. Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments at this time? We do not have any comments at this time. Okay, do my colleagues have any questions or comments on this item? Okay, seeing none. Um, this item will return for action on May 11th. We are now at item I-7, variable term waiver. Mr. Oropalo, please begin when you're ready. Good evening, President Vasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham. Superintendent is recommending that the board approve the submission of a variable term waiver to the California Commission on Teaching Credentialing effective 1-28-21 through 6 21 for a speech language pathologist credential for the 2021 school year. And at this time, I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Oropalo. Mr. Allen, do we have any public comments on this item? We have had no comments submitted, nor do we have any hands raised at this time. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Do any of my colleagues have um, questions or comments on this item? Okay, seeing none. This is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the submission of one variable term waiver to the California Commission on Teaching Teacher Credentialing? It's been moved by Mr. Hernandez and seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye, aye. that was unanimous. With that, we are at item J, board reports. Are there any board reports? Mr. Hernandez. I'll just go very quick. I had the opportunity to visit an elementary school and a high school yesterday. Wanted to see the kids. Uh, and I, I, I did go unannounced because I just wanted to see, uh, you know, the kids and didn't really want anything else. But I was so impressed, impressed with the manner, uh, how happy the kids were to be back at school. But more importantly, the, uh, the, uh, the structure and the diligence of the students, like you said, to wear masks, 
it was just amazing to see. And I was able to walk a couple kids through their elementary class and to have them say, you know, uh, I'm just so happy to be back. It was, it's just, it was just awesome to see. So thank you very much for those principals that let me come on unannounced. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Costa. Dr. McKibben and I had the opportunity to attend the Region 6 CSBA meeting, and um, we were able to talk with our colleagues in other districts. Also, um, I had such fun. I visited Elizabeth McBride's preschool classroom by Zoom, and to watch preschoolers who totally understood the processes and routines and had so much fun learning and their excitement to be with their teacher was just a wonderful opportunity. It made my whole day. I also attended the Spirit of San Juan um, ceremony and it was perfect for Zoom. I never realized that, but it was the right kind of ceremony for, for a Zoom call and just gave us a chance to celebrate those people in our district that are making a difference. And also attended Mr. Kern's SPAC meetings on Thursday night and Friday morning and got great input from parents with their thinking about um, next steps for the district in terms of student learning and learning loss. So that was great. And then on a sad note, Trent Teague, who is a music teacher, was a music teacher in San Juan, passed away today. And I just wanted to be sure that we remembered him. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Dr. McKibben. Yeah, I also wanted, wanted to uh, uh, mention that I, I attended the uh, uh, SPAC meeting and I wanted to comment about how uh, and, and and as for some of the don't know we're doing SPAC meetings both on Thursday night and Friday morning and uh, we ended up in in breakout rooms and that sort of thing and wanted to thank the the thoughtfulness uh, SPAC is organized so that basically all schools uh, can be represented and, and the majority of them I believe were uh, in this meeting but it, uh, but it was particularly interesting to hear uh, these parents that uh, do represent the schools talk about uh, their experience over the year and, and give us their ideas related to some of the new uh, funding that we're, we're seeking and so forth and how thoughtful it was and really impressive. And, and I just want to thank those parents for, for being so thoughtful about our kids, their resilience, and, and taking our school forward into the, into the next year. Another one of the things that I did wearing my uh, rotary hat was that uh, I uh, was looking at the scholarship applications from both Casa Roble and uh, Bella Vista. And uh, you, when you look at the, those scholarship ap applications, you can't help but be really, frankly, wowed by, by that sort of thing and, uh, and impressed with our students. And finally, uh, I wanted to thank uh, 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 particularly Project Optimism and Improve Your Tomorrow and others for having the social justice forums for both middle schools and, and high schools and how thoughtful those young men and women are about uh, how much they care about each other and, and the way that they exhibit that in, in those meetings. And, and again, thanks to our partners uh, for for arranging those and continuing to support uh, our students. President Viasquez, can I build just a little bit off of what Dr. McKibben said? Um, we started an SSAC scholarship this, real, this year that's really about the students. It's gonna be, you know, they created the criteria for students to apply. Uh, we think we're gonna be able to give out $2,500 scholarships this year. We had 168 students apply this year. And I mean, we had every school, six from CASA, 22 from BV, 19 from Del Campo, 13 from El Camino, 13 from Encina, 23 from Mesa, 24 from Mariloma, 24 from Rio, six from San Juan and four from our alternative schools. So we're, it's gonna be neat that we talked about, this is the first year and, and I know some of you participated. 
but to be able to start something like that um, in a challenging year like this. So I just wanted to build off of that because that, that is a, it's really a positive thing that we're gonna be able to affect students at every one of our schools this year. Thank you, Superintendent Kern and Dr. McKibben for the report. Um, I, I won't be, I won't cover too many of the items that have already been um, covered, but I will also just say thank you to our spirit of San Juan, um, the team that puts it together, everybody who was nominated, and of course to our awardees as well. Um, I was able to join the um, Cal SSD meeting with Superintendent Kern, which is the California um, Suburban School District Association, where we heard an update from some of our state public health leaders um, alongside um, our part, our school board and school partners throughout the region, um, where they shared some of the information related to the vaccine rollout and importance of testing and some other public health measures. Um, I also was able to um, join one of the um, SPAC meetings, um, and it's always um, a great opportunity to hear, hear from our parents. Um, I think it was just yesterday, I got to um, join the San Juan Youth Voice Advocates, um, which are a, a team of um, students from throughout the district, supported significantly by some of our staff members that have um, undergone training on how to use their voice and how to make an impact in the community. And so there was the recognition um, ceremony for them and uh, it was really fantastic. It was virtual, but it was still really wonderful. And there was a panel discussion where they also asked some questions of some of our district leaders and it was really fantastic to be a part of it. And I was so inspired by our students as I continue to be. So that was really a pleasure. And then I've been able to also do a few um, site site visits as well. I look forward to continuing those through the rest of the year. Also just wanted to um, make sure my colleagues knew very exciting news from the USDA yesterday about the expansion and continued support of our school meal program. So um, due to COVID, there were program changes that made it free to everyone regardless of income. And so the, um, the Biden administration is continuing that through the 2021 2022 school year, which is very exciting news in terms of continuing to address and support um, food insecurity and hunger in our communities. Of course, there is also um, the component around we use that free and reduced meal lunch application for a lot of pieces. And so um, definitely a broader win, but we'll have to get a little bit more creative about how we collect that information, um, but we'll take the win where we can. Um, and then also just as on FYI to my colleagues, um, I've accepted, we all have other hats that we wear. And so I've actually accepted a new role. And so I'll be transitioning from um, my um, state role as Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services um, to Director of Legislative Advocacy for the California Welfare Directors Association, where I will be um, advocating on behalf of um, some of our most vulnerable California neighbors, including the child welfare system. Um, and our neighbors um, experiencing poverty and supportive housing and um, food resilience and community support, all those good things. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and so with that, seeing no other comments for board reports, um, we are at item K, future agenda items. Do any board members wish to add any um, items to the future agenda? Seeing none, we are now at visitor comments, um, item L. Mr. Allen, are there any visitor comments? We have no submitted comments. And if you've joined us here on the Zoom environment, we'd like to offer a comment on a topic that wasn't on tonight's agenda. Now's your final opportunity to do so just by clicking that raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And we have no raised hands at this time, President Viasquez. If it's okay, I'm just gonna wait for about 10 more seconds if my colleagues are okay. I just, I know some folks um, raise their hands on a previous item. So I just wanna make sure folks have the opportunity to raise their hand on Zoom. Mr. Allen, will you just prompt one more time um, the reminder on how to use the raise your hand function? 
Certainly, if you've joined us on Zoom, you can click that raise hand button found at the bottom of your screen on a mobile device or your desktop client. Or if you've dialed into the meeting tonight, you can press star nine on your telephone keypad to raise your hand. Okay. Seeing none, um, we do not need to return to closed session at this time, so we are adjourned. Thank you all. The next meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education is scheduled for Tuesday, May 11th. We do anticipate being on Zoom and YouTube again. We hope you'll be able to join us. Thanks for being with us tonight. <laughs>